Welcome back to Focus on the Light, a weekly Come Follow Me podcast. This week, following the schedule with John chapter 1. But before starting the episode and talking about John chapter 1, I just wanted to share something that I'm excited about is a way for me to connect with my podcast listeners more consistently than once a week and to hear feedback from you. So it is something called a Marco Polo Sharecast for those of you that already joined. Thank you. I'm so glad you have. Um, But it is a simple way where consistently I can share little thoughts or messages uh, to Marco Polo. And it's just a group that you join. However, no one else in the group knows that you've joined. I'm the, you, the contact is only between you and I, so it's more individualized and you're not joining a giant group, but you're able to hopefully connect with Focus on the Light more frequently. If you'd like to join that, it is linked below. Now, let's get on to what you are all here for, John chapter one. Before we get into the specific scriptures of John, though, I want you to imagine two things in your mind. Whatever it is you're doing, you know, mowing the lawn, getting ready for the day, sitting on the couch, whatever you're doing, listening to this, in your mind, I just want you to remember something, to reflect on your memories and your experiences in life. Um, Recall a time when being spiritual or religious or having a certain moral standard was socially unpopular. When was a time in your life where you felt the social pressure to not be that way, and maybe you weren't, or you were, whatever, but just an environment where you felt the social status was that spirituality is uncool. Remember that experience. Now, I also want you to think of someone you know who is not yourself and not somebody in the scriptures, someone you know in your life who is extremely confident in and convicted of their spirituality and religion. Someone who you see that even in maybe those unpopular situations, they're confident in what they believe and confident in appropriately expressing it. If you're like me, you might have wondered what about that person gave them the courage to be that way. Now, this episode, I'm not trying to say that your religion and your love for God needs to become your entire personality. It should not, but it should be a part of who we are. And I see as this podcast is intended for use and young adults that religion and spirituality and caring about it and making it known that you care about those things is socially unpopular. And we should care or should learn to care or develop the care to overcome those social pressures of uncoolness and live our religion anyway. But I don't want to give you the answer of how to do that. Because it really wouldn't be an answer. It's something that you have to answer for yourself how you are going to do that. But I wanted to start the questioning of that because the book of John is a wonderful book of scripture that can help you answer that question. John is a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's an apostle and he has had remarkable experiences with Jesus Christ. He, in his writing, wants us to have similar experiences with Jesus, to learn to value Jesus Christ the way that he does. John specifically is writing to the members or the believers, if you will, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing to individuals who don't currently believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. John is writing to individuals who already do. He's just writing so that they can have greater experiences with Jesus Christ and learn to value and have faith in him even more as John did because of the remarkable and miraculous experiences he had with Jesus Christ. So in studying chapter one, I thought with John starting, what is it that he wants us to know about Jesus Christ from the beginning? And studying John chapter one, these are the things that I came up with. He is the creator of the world. Now, when I say he, I mean Jesus Christ. He is the creator of the world. He lived with God in glory. Prophets are sent to earth to testify of him. He gives light to everyone on earth. When we receive him, we are given power to become, uh, specifically power through baptism and our covenants with God and the grace that Jesus Christ extends to us. We are also children of God. That is an important thing for us to understand as we understand Jesus Christ, that as he is the son of God, so are we. Makes me think of Romans chapter eight. Um, John wants us to know that redemption comes from Jesus Christ, as does the law in verse 17, grace and truth. Uh, Jesus will and can baptize us with the Holy Ghost, which makes me wonder why is that important to understand? I'll come back to that in a second. He is the Lamb of God and will take away the sins of the world. He is inviting. Jesus Christ is an inviting individual. He asks us to come and see. 
Jesus Christ sees us, which I'll come back to that one as well. And lastly, he will bring about greater things. So back to the first one, Jesus Christ will will and can baptize us with the Holy Ghost. An important thing that John the Baptist and John the Revelator, the writer, makes known here that that's something that Jesus Christ will do. And it's an important thing to know about Jesus Christ. It made me wonder, why is that something important for me to understand about Jesus Christ? As I try to have similar experiences that John has had, why would knowing that Jesus Christ can baptize me with the Holy Ghost be important? And I think, yes, there's the importance of just understanding the higher law that Jesus Christ would bring, that he would bring the baptism of fire, not just the baptism of water. But I also think that the baptism of fire represents that Jesus Christ can change us. While that John the Baptist could only baptize people with water, meaning cleanse them through baptism, welcome them into the covenant through the grace of Jesus Christ, ultimately, Jesus Christ has the ability to purify us, to change us, to sanctify us as the Holy Ghost does. And then I also want to come back to Jesus seeing us because this is something that is uh, really cool to me to see how this worked out this week. Before I get to the see us thing, I just want to share an experience that if you uh, are on the Marco Polo Sharecast, you've heard a little bit of this before. I go to Enzyme College, which is a church school. So every day we get to have a devotional and a spiritual thought before class starts. Then recently we were talking about in Helaman when he calls the word of God quick and powerful and what it means for the word of God to be quick. And my professor mentioned how in archaic meanings, quick means alive, as in the phrase, the quick and the dead, meaning living and not. And how in our day, that meaning has come to change something that is speedy. And we began to talk about how the word of God is alive and what that means, that, that there is living, current, modern revelation to a prophet of God on earth today, and that comes to us individually, that the word of God is alive because God is alive and he still speaks, which is a wonderful truth and I love. But as I thought about that, I thought if the word of God is alive, God knowing that the word quick, what eventually means speedy, could inspire the word quick to be written, knowing that one day it would mean something that it doesn't. So allowing alive to, to kind of create a double standard here, that it means alive and also means speedy because it is alive, I began to contemplate in which ways the word of God is speedy or is quick. I'm going to get back to that in a second because I want to just spend some time talking about the word of God being alive because this was a moment where, to me, the word of God is alive in that regard, meaning that words change over time and they begin to mean different things and how those different meanings are still meanings from God. Uh, Because in John chapter 1, uh, verse 47 and 48, Nathanael comes to see Jesus Christ, um, and Jesus Christ says, Behold, an Israel indeed, in whom there is no guile. Uh, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip came, called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And, you know, that, that could very literally mean that he just saw him, like with his eyes, he saw Nathanael which made me believe Nathaniel was on his own, I'm imagining, sitting under a fig tree. Jesus Christ is aware of us, the awareness that physical sight brings, that he's aware of our situations and our circumstances and where we are physically and all the impacts that that has on our life. But because the word of God is alive, see in our day is starting to become something else that when you see someone, when when you felt seen by someone, it's that you felt known, you felt understood Jesus Christ sees us in that way to talk about the recent movie because I'm a big movie fan, Avatar and Avatar the Way of Wanderers. They, they say, I see you, right? I know you. I understand you in, in a very personal way that in this case, John wanting us to understand that Jesus Christ sees us in both ways. He sees us in the way that he's aware of us and he sees us in the way where he knows and understands us. Just a cool example of the word of God being alive. Now, back to the thought about the word of God being speedy. I, in that Marco Polo Sharecast, I asked people to share with me in which ways have they felt that the word of God was speedy or quick. And my aunt replied, 
she had a wonderful insight that I really, really loved. She talked about the Holy Ghost and how because the Word of God is alive, we're able to be inspired and have things revealed to us through the Holy Ghost. But also how the Holy Ghost is at time very speedy. Warnings or promptings that we have for our safety come very quick. They come speedily. Which I thought was a wonderful answer, how sometimes the Word of God is speedy in the things that He needs to say to us in the circumstances that we need. And at times, it seems that it is very slow. But the Word of God does have the capability to be speedy, to be quick, personally, which I thought was a wonderful answer to that question. So thank you, Aunt Janet. That was a, I loved your answer. There's still an option available for you to join the ShareCast and share your thoughts with me. I would love to hear them. But we've got this list here of things that John would want us to know about Jesus Christ as we strive to have experiences like him. Why would John want us to know these things? Again, that's something that each of us are going to have to answer individually with this question. How could knowing these things about Jesus Christ help me value him more? That's a wonderful question to answer in each aspect. Um, there's one that I just want to focus on as a little tangent, and then two others I, I want to focus on for, for kind of the rest of the episode. And w- the first one that's a little tangent is that he gives light to all. So in John chapter 1, um, verse 7, oh no, sorry, verse 9. So in John chapter 1, verse 9, speaking about Jesus Christ being the light, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This idea that Jesus Christ gives light to anyone who comes into the world, anyone who is born. And this idea has just been on my mind recently, and I'm not sure why. I think that we, as believers, particularly members of the church, have a tendency to believe that certain individuals have more light than others. And that's true. I, I, you know, that's obvious. However, Jesus Christ gives light unto everyone. And while there are ways to receive more light in your life, it's an opening thought that in his knowing and seeing of people, it is to everyone. And that's just a brief tangent I wanted to spend some time on. But back to what I was actually planning to talk about, because I was unplanned. But what I plan to talk about is, is how John, from the immediate beginning, draws attention to Jesus Christ's mortal life and his condescension into a mortal body and life that is is at times quite brutal. So as you're sitting here doing the dishes or walking to class or driving, I want you to think about all the qualities and aspects of Jesus Christ's pre-mortal life. Who was he and what was his life like before coming to earth? Give you a second to think about it. Now, I want you to ponder about his life on earth. How did it start? How did it go? the highs and the lows of his life on earth. The last few weeks of Come Follow Me, we got a study about the beginning and we kind of saw from the get-go, it was kind of rough with a king trying to kill him and have him to run for his life, but also three kings coming to worship him and give him gifts. But we have that contrast. What was his pre-mortal life like and what was his life on earth? And as we ponder about that, we have the words of John to use to compare them. Um, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The creator of the world gave up his glory to come to earth to be rejected, and eventually killed, where he had to willingly give up his life, but he was rejected. The creator of the world, he came unto his own, and they received him not. Jesus Christ gave up a lot to come to earth. Um, Elder Richard C. Ed- Edgley, in this uh, quote that I found, says, quote, He descended to be born of mortal woman. He descended to be baptized of man, even though he was perfect and sinless. He descended to minister to the humblest of the humble. He descended to subject himself to the will of the Father, suffering himself to be tempted, mocked, scourged, cast out, and disowned, even though he was all-powerful. He descended to be judged of the world, even though he was the judge of the world. He descended to be lifted on the cross and slain for the sins of the world, even though no man could take away his life. He descended not because of obligation, nor for glory, but only for love. 
His condescension to redeem us through the atonement was the price he paid to provide salvation and exaltation. Close quote. The only reason Jesus Christ descended was because of his love. He gave up so much to come to earth to endure so much harshness and so much sadness and sorrow and anguish solely because of love. So as you sit there listening to my voice, I want you to take a moment to pause this episode or think about it throughout the rest of the day. Ponder about this question. What about me or you? So what about you? Is so worth loving that he was willing to descend below all. As you go throughout your day, think about that. What about you is so worth loving that Jesus Christ was willing to descend below all? Because there is an answer. There are many answers to that question. And I think as John tries to help us have an experience with Jesus Christ, to learn to value Jesus Christ and value who he is, while he teaches remarkable things about Jesus Christ and the selfless nature of Jesus Christ, it also teaches us something about who we are. Because as we value ourselves, we are able to value Jesus Christ. And as we value Jesus Christ, we are able to value ourselves. But sometimes we skip that second part of valuing ourselves. I think John wants us to see how much we are really worth. How much we are worth to the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist says. So think about that. What about you is so worth loving? And allow the Holy Ghost to answer the question for you so Heavenly Father can tell you what he feels about you. Briefly to close out this episode, just some disconnected thoughts from that message from John chapter one that I just wanted to mention. This first one is one that has would have gone completely unnoticed had it not been for Zany, my sister, sharing something with me. Now, again, if you're on the Marco Polo Sharecast, you've heard a part of this. Again, join it. It's linked below. But this wonderful idea Zany talked to me about, shared this quote with me, shared this principle with me, and uh, it's been on my mind ever since and it influenced the way I learned from the scriptures. So Zany gave me this analogy, this parable, if you will, in, in a light room, in, in, the, in a summer day, when the sun's out, in the middle of the day, you're outside and your phone flashlight actually turns on, it can go, you can go a while without ever noticing. You and the people around you may never notice that your flashlight is on because of the abundance of light around you. That small little light from your phone gets drowned out or gets ignored or just soaked up in the rest of the light. There's not a lot of attention drawn to it. Then if we are meant to shine our light in our spirituality and in our standards, It can be easy to shine our light in the moments of brightness when we are surrounded by other lights. However, take that same phone light, now go in a dark room at night when all the lights are off, and it is very obvious whose phone has the flashlight on. And at times, people's attention will be on you because of it. Zany talked to me about the idea how we have to be willing to shine our light even in the dark. And this is the quote she shared with me from Elder Christofferson's article in the March 2022 Liahona. He says, quote, we must learn to be righteous in all circumstances, or as President Brigham Young said, even in the dark. Close quote. Now that's idea has just been on my mind. It's a wonderful idea. So thank you again, Zany. But it's, it's been on my mind, particularly with John the Baptist here. In verse 19 and 20 of John chapter one, the Levites and priests from Jerusalem, come to John and ask who he is. And in verse 20 specifically, and he confessed and denied not. John had the faith to shine his light in the dark. The misunderstanding of others did not frighten him. John was willing to shine his light, which I think is cool because later in verse 31, something occurred to me that John the Baptist did not know Jesus Christ maybe the way we think he immediately did because they were cousins. As he says, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. John's saying, I I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know the Messiah, only the prophecies, and I had faith in those. Yet that faith was enough for John 
to shine his light even in the dark. Now, this quote from Ella Christofferson, out of context, talking about dark situations, sounds like these circumstances where we're surrounded by people who are unbelieving and we are the sole believer, the sole light, um, which is totally true, an absolutely true principle. However, in context, in, in context, however, in context of the rest of the article, Ella Christofferson here is talking about affliction and trials in life and how those are moments in our life where it is dark. And both interpretations of this quote work perfectly with this example of John the Baptist. Uh, he was surrounded by people who did not believe and misunderstood, and so he was the sole light and had to shine in that way. On top of that, we could add that being judged and ridiculed and criticized by the world would be an affliction, and he was willing to shine and have faith amidst that affliction nonetheless. And we see that continue into, up until the moment he is killed. Um, because John had the faith to shine his light in the dark, whatever the cause of the dark was. Now, the last thought that I have is about this invitation. As John taught us that Jesus Christ is an inviting individual, he invites us to come and see. And there's this quote from the Come, Follow Me book that I absolutely loved, speaking about the apostles, the disciples, who had been waiting for the prophesied Messiah, the Come follow me, Emmanuel says. When they met him, how did they know that he was the one they had been seeking? How did they know Jesus Christ was? And then they immediately answered the question with something that I love. The same way all of us come to know the Savior, by accepting the invitation to come and see for ourselves. We read about him in the scriptures. We hear his doctrine. We observe his way of living. We feel his spirit. Along the way, we discover, as Nathaniel did, that the Savior knows us and loves us and wants to prepare us to receive greater things. The answer to the question is that we have experiences with him. We try the word of God, as the scriptures say. And the, one of the phrases as they see him is in the scriptures in, in John chapter one is that they found the Messiah. And I've been pondering about what does it mean to find the Messiah in your life. And when you do, are we as excited as Peter was to go and tell others around us? Are we aware of the other people in our life who are looking? Because Peter didn't immediately go tell everyone. He went to his brother because he knew his brother was also looking. Are we aware of our brothers and sisters who are looking for the Messiah so that when we find him, we can have the courage to go tell him about them as well? I hope so. If you would like to make an attempt to do that, to share your finding of the Messiah with someone who is looking, and this podcast is a way for you to do that. There are links below for you to share so that they can come and see through the New Testament and learning about Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful for Jesus Christ that he's an inviting individual, that he's an individual that gives us light um, because I am grateful for the light that he has given my life because of the experiences I've had with him. I'm grateful for the Holy Ghost that has given me an understanding of myself and the value that Jesus Christ gives me. And because of that, I value Jesus Christ. As John in 1 John says, we love him because he first loved us. And I know and I testify that he truly does love you. Remember that as you consider what about yourself is worth loving that much. You'll be surprised, I hope, with the answers you allow the Holy Ghost to teach you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for listening to another episode of Focus on the Light. My name is Harrison, and I love talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you benefited from this and you would like to share it, there is a link below where you can share this podcast with anyone so they can find it wherever they listen to podcasts. Focus on the Light is a weekly Come Follow Me podcast intended to help specifically youth and young adults to not just learn about the gospel, but to apply it and see the reality that it can take in their lives. Focus on the light wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.